Well, Thomas, thank you for that that introduction, uh, and it's a delight to be back in Zurich, uh, one of my favorite cities, and, and to have a chance to interact with Thomas and colleagues at the SMB, really one of the pillars of the global central banking uh, uh, community, so it's a real honor. Uh, and in particular, I'm delighted to participate in the second annual conference on risk, uncertainty, and volatility that's sponsored by the Federal Reserve Board, the BIS, and the Swiss National Bank. And I'd especially like to thank the Swiss National Bank for hosting uh, this event at an incredible, uh, at incredible facility in an incredible spot. This conference is part of continuing work across all of our institutions and the academic community to better quantify and assess the implications of risk and uncertainty. I am pleased that this year the focus of the conference is on two of my long-standing professional interests, financial interests markets, and monetary policy. And in my remarks today, I will not stray far from those interests. I've titled my talk, Monetary Policy, Price Stability, and Equilibrium Bond Yields, Success and Consequences. And in this paper, I will address an issue that has been much in focus, the secular decline in global bond yields, highlighting the role of monetary policy in contributing to this decline, and the implications of this decline for the conduct of monetary policy. One of the most remarkable and fundamental changes in the global financial landscape has been the steady and significant decline in global sovereign bond yields. From the late 1980s, when 10-year Treasury yields in the US and sovereign rates in many other countries were at or above 10%, Global bond yields in the advanced economies have trended lower to levels below 2% uh, today. We all know this, but it is dramatic to see, to see the chart when many of us began our uh, careers. To understand and interpret this decline, it is useful to think of the yield on a nominal 10-year bond as the sum of two components. Investors' expectation over the next 10 years of the average level of short-term interest rates plus a term premium. The term premium is the additional compensation that bondholders require for assuming the risk of holding a long duration asset <clears throat> with greater exposure to interest rate and inflation volatility. Importantly, according to economic theory, the equilibrium term premium can be negative. In this case, which is relevant today in the US and perhaps some other countries, the exposure to interest rate and inflation volatility embedded in a long maturity bond is more than offset by the potential value of that bond in hedging other risks, for example, equity risk. The expectation of the average level of future short-term interest rates can in turn be decomposed in the average of future real interest rates and expectations of future inflation rates. Performing this standard decomposition reveals that the decline in long-term rates reflects the decline in all three of these components, expected real rates, expected inflation, uh, and the term premium. I will now discuss each of these components in turn. With respect to expected real short rates, one reason investors expect lower future interest rates is that neutral interest rates appear to have declined worldwide and are expected to remain low. The concept of a neutral level for the short-term real rate is referred to in the academic literature as our star, and it corresponds to the rate consistent with a level of aggregate demand equal to and growing in pace with aggregate supply and an unchanged rate of inflation. Longer run secular trends in R star largely or even entirely reflect fundamental real factors that are outside the control of the central bank. Policymakers and academics alike have spent a lot of time exploring the reasons for and ramifications of the decline in R star across countries. For example, Many have pointed to slowing population growth and a moderation in the pace of technological change as consistent with a lower level of R star. Changes in risk tolerance and regulation have led to an increase in saving and the demand for safe assets, which are also pushing down yields on sovereign bonds. Importantly, 
Economic theory suggests, and empirical research confirms, that there is a significant common global component embedded in individual country, our stars. This common factor driving individual country, our stars, not only reflects the influence of common global shocks affecting all economies in a similar way, but also results from international capital flows that respond to and over time tend to narrow divergences in rates of return offered across different countries. Other things being equal, a decline in the common factor driving individual country R stars would be expected to produce a comparable common decline in global bond yields. In addition to the decline in R star around the world, lower long-term bond yields, of course, also reflect the influence of the initial downshift and ultimate anchoring of inflation expectations in many countries after the mid-1990s. Now, of course, unlike the decline in R star, which reflects fundamental real factors that are outside the control of the central bank, the decline and ultimate anchoring of inflation and inflation expectations in both major and emerging economies were the direct consequence of the widespread adoption and commitment to transparent, flexible inflation targeting monetary policy strategies. For example, in the United States, after the collapse of Bretton Woods, inflation spiraled upward, hitting double-digit rates in the 1970s and early 1980s. But, my, but by the mid-1980s, the back of inflation had been broken. Thank you, Paul Volcker, wherever you are. And total inflation averaged less than 4% from 85 to 1990. Following the 1991 recession, inflation fell further, and by the mid-1990s, the condition for price stability in the U.S. had been achieved. And thank you to Alan Greenspan, wherever you are. From the mid-1990s until the Great Recession, U.S. inflation averaged about 2%. And of course, this step down in inflation has been global with other major advanced economies and many emerging economies experiencing a similar downshift. And just to document those declines, we have this table here. Now, to the extent that this step down in inflation is expected to persist, long-term yields have reflected this decline one for one. However, not only has the average level of inflation fallen, but inflation has also become more stable. After considerable volatility in the 1970s and 80s, over the past few decades, inflation has moved only within relatively narrow range in many countries, despite significant swings in commodity prices, recessions, and unprecedented monetary policy actions in the great global financial crisis. Document here just the decline in, in volatility of inflation that we've also seen in the data. What has been behind this global decline in inflation volatility? I would argue, as have many others, that monetary policy played a key role in reducing not only the average rate of inflation, but also the volatility of inflation. Inflation targeting monetary policy can plausibly influence the various of inflation through several channels. For example, in a textbook DSGE model featuring a central bank that implements policy via, via a Taylor type rule, the equilibrium variance of inflation will be lower the more aggressively the central bank leans against any exogenous shocks that might push inflation away from target. So even if the variance of the underlying shocks is constant, the variance of realized inflation will be an endogenous function of monetary policy. Another related channel through which monetary policy can influence the variance of inflation is by changing the equilibrium persistence of inflation deviations from target, if you will, the half-life of those deviations. Again, in a textbook model augmented with a hybrid Phillips curve that features some inertial backward-looking component, the equilibrium persistence of inflation dynamics will be an endogenous function of monetary policy, such that the more aggressively the central bank leans against inflation shocks, the less persistent will be inflation deviations and the lower will be the endogenous volatility of inflation. Now, of course, non-monetary factors may also have contributed to the lower variance of inflation. For example, the variance of underlying exogenous shocks to aggregate supply and demand may have fortuitously and coincidentally fallen in tandem with the adoption 
of inflation targeting in many countries. I will now turn to a third factor behind the decline in global bond yields, the decline in the term premium that is estimated to have occurred in many countries over the past 20 years. Most studies find that term premiums have fallen substantially in major economies over the past 20 years, and that in the US, term premiums may have been negative for some time. Decomposing the factors that drive term premiums is an active area of academic research, and I will not attempt to summarize or synthesize this vast literature. But I would like to emphasize what seems to me to be three contributors to the decline in the term premium in the US and perhaps in some other countries as well. First, the decline in inflation volatility has almost certainly been an important driving factor making the term premium lower on nominal bond yields. The real ex post payoff from holding a nominal bond to maturity is directly exposed to price level risk and thus a decline in inflation volatility makes the real purchasing power of the bond less risky. Through this channel, the decline in inflation volatility should be reflected in uh, smaller inflation risk premiums in nominal bond yields, which is exactly what we estimate in the term premium model uh, that we've developed and that we use uh, at the Fed. Indeed, in the Fed's yield curve model, uh, the model attributes about 100 basis points of the decline in the US term premium to a decline in the inflation risk premium. A second likely contributor to the decline in the US term premium, at least over the past decade, is the Fed's substantial purchase of long duration treasury securities and mortgage backed securities in our large scale asset purchase programs uh, between 2008 and 2014. These purchases, which were concentrated at the longer end of the US yield curve, took duration out of the market and thus lowered the equilibrium yield required by investors to hold the reduced supply of long duration assets. Estimates of the cumulative effect of these purchases on the US term premium span a wide range with some estimates above 100 basis points. Moreover, and this is an important point, the global market for sovereign bonds and currency hedge duration is tightly integrated and it seems likely that asset purchase programs in some other major economies, such as Japan and the Euro area and the UK, have contributed as well to reducing the term premium in the US. And of course, US LSAT programs likely contributed to lower term premiums abroad. A third contributor to a lower US term premium is less widely appreciated than lower inflation volatility and the LSAT programs. And this third factor reflects the value that bonds have provided over the past 20 years as a hedge against equity risk. As documented by Campbell, Sundrum, and Vissera, and in a later paper by Campbell, Fluger, and Vissera, the empirical correlation between US bond and stock returns changed sign in the late 1980s from positive uh, to negative. And here's a paper, here's a, a chart reproduced from this, their paper. In the 1970s and 80s, the sign of the correlation was positive, which implied that in those days, bond and stock returns tended to rise and fall together. In this period, bonds provided a diversification benefit when added to an equity portfolio. The bond return beta to stocks was around 0.2, but not a hedge against equity risk. But since the late 90s, the empirical correlation between bond and stock returns has typically been negative and the bond return beta to stocks has averaged about a negative 0.2. This means that since the late 1990s, bond returns tend to be high and positive when stock returns are low and negative, so that nominal bonds have been a valuable outright hedge against equity risk. As such, we would expect the equilibrium yield on bonds to be lower than otherwise, and certainly relative to the prior period when the correlation was opposite, as investors should bid up their price to reflect their value as a hedge against equity risk. Now, according to Campbell and co-authors, the hedging value of nominal bonds with a negative beta to stocks could substantially lower the equilibrium term premium. Quoting from their paper, from peak to trough, the realized beta of treasury bonds has declined by about 0.6% and has changed sign. According to a simple CAPM model, this would imply that the term premium on a 10-year zero-coupon treasury should have declined by about 60% of the equity premium. Let me give you a concrete example. 
of what turned out to be the ex post hedging value of bonds for equity risk in the global financial crisis. In 2008, the total return on the S&P index was minus 37%, while the total return on the on-the-run 30-year Treasury bonds was plus 38%. So a 50-50 portfolio would have been flat in the great financial crisis in 08. Now, there is likely no single explanation for the change in sign of the correlation between equilibrium bond and stock returns in the U.S. and other major economies. And I asked my team at the board, and indeed, you see this change in sign occurs also in Germany and the United uh, Kingdom. We'd be happy to plot it for Switzerland when we get uh, uh, back. There's no likely single explanation for this change of sign. Uh, one recent paper that does rigorously model the changing value of nominal bonds as a hedge against equity risk is the paper by John Campbell and co-authors I mentioned earlier. This paper develops and estimates a modern, very, uh, very sophisticated asset pricing model in which the sign of the covariance between equity and bond returns depends upon the reduced form correlation between inflation, the output gap, the correlation between the policy rate and the output gap, as well as the persistence of inflation. Now, this paper is agnostic as to why the reduced form correlation between inflation and the output gap and the funds rate and the output gap both change sign in their sample, which spans the period 1979 to 2011. But the authors do demonstrate that in their model, these reduced form sign changes are sufficient to generate the sign change in the correlation between equilibrium returns that we observe in the data. I myself believe that the change in US monetary policy that began in 1979 under Paul Volcker and that was extended by Alan Greenspan in the 1990s very likely contributed to the change in the sign of the correlation between uh, inflation, the output gap, and the, and the correlation between the policy rate and the output gap that we observe in the, in the data. And certainly this is a topic that I worked on with Mark and Jordy years ago. These are the sort of patterns that a simple model of optimal monetary policy would produce when starting from an adverse initial condition in which inflation is well above the implicit target, as was the case in 1979. In these models, high initial inflation triggers a policy response for the central bank to push up the real policy rate well above inflation in order to push output below potential via a Phillips curve, lowering inflation towards target. If this policy succeeds ex post, inflation expectations become anchored at a new lower level of inflation. And policy can then respond to demand shocks by adjusting real rates pro-cyclically. Inflation will also tend to be pro-cyclical with well-anchored inflation expectations if demand shocks dominate and inflation expectations remain anchored. So let's discuss now some implications of all this. By lowering expected inflation, by anchoring expected inflation at a low level, by contributing to a reduction in the volatility of inflation, and by contributing to creating a hedging value of long-duration bonds, inflation targeting monetary policy has lowered equilibrium bond yields relative to equilibrium short rates substantially compared with the experience of the 1970s and 80s. But as I noted earlier, during the past decade, equilibrium short rates have themselves fallen dramatically. These two phenomena taken together have resulted in sovereign bond yields that are substantially lower than the pre-crisis experience, and thus substantially closer to the effective lower bound for the policy rate than they were before the crisis. But what does this mean for monetary policy? At its most basic level, the answer to this question could depend on how far the nominal policy rate is from the effect of lower bound, and the extent to which the term premium on long duration bonds can become even more negative than it is at present, at least in the US. While I do not have a precise answer to this question, I will confess that I think it's highly unlikely that in the next downturn, whenever it is, the 10 year treasury yields will fall by the 390 basis points we observed between 07 and 2016, or even the 360 basis points that we observed between January of 2000 and 2003. The reality of low neutral rates and equilibrium bond yields has motivated us at the Federal Reserve to take a hard look this year at our monetary policy strategy, tools, and communications practices. 
While we believe our existing framework has served us well, we believe now is a good time to step back and assess whether and in what ways we can refine our strategy, tools, and communications practices to achieve and maintain our goals as consistently as possible in the world we live in today. Now, as I have noted before, the review of our current framework is wide-ranging, and we are not prejudging where it will take us. But events of the past decade highlight three broad questions that we will seek to answer with our review. The first question is, can the Fed best meet its statutory objective with its existing strategy, or should it consider strategies that aim to reverse past misses of the inflation objective? At our September FOMC meeting, we discussed makeup strategies in which policymakers would promise to make up for past inflation shortfalls with a sustained accommodative stance of policy intended to generate higher future inflation. Such strategies provide accommodation at the ELB by keeping the policy rate low for an extended period. Makeup strategies may also help anchor inflation expectations at the 2% objective. But the benefits of makeup strategies depend importantly on the private sector's understanding of them, as well as the belief that future policymakers will follow through on promises to keep policy accommodative. An advantage of our current framework over the makeup approach is that it has provided the committee with the flexibility to assess a broad range of factors and information in choosing policy actions. And these actions can and do vary depending upon economic circumstances in order to best achieve our goals. We are also considering whether our existing policy tools are adequate to achieve and maintain our employment and price stability objectives, or whether our toolkit should be expanded, and if so, how. Because the U.S. economy required additional support after the ELB was reached, the committee deployed two additional tools beyond changes in the federal funds rate, balance sheet policies and forward guidance. The review is examining the efficacy of these tools, as well as additional tools for easing policy when the ELB is binding, in light of the more recent experiences of other countries. Finally, we are focusing on how the committee can improve the communication of its policy framework and actions. Our communication practices have evolved considerably since 1994, when the committee first released a statement after a FOMC meeting. As part of the review, we are assessing the committee's current and past practices and additional forms of communication that could be helpful. In terms of process, we've heard from a broad range of interested individuals and groups in 14 Fed Listens events this year. At our July 2019 meeting, the committee began to assess what we've learned from these events and to receive briefing from the staff on topics relevant to the review. But we still have much to discuss at upcoming meetings. We will share our findings with the public when we have completed our review, likely during the first half of 2020. So to conclude, the econ economy is constantly evolving, bringing with it new opportunities and challenges. One of these challenges is how best to conduct monetary policy in the new world of low equilibrium interest rates. It makes sense for us to remain open-minded as we assess current practice and consider ideas that could potentially enhance our ability to deliver on the goals that Congress has assigned to us. For this reason, my colleagues and I do not want to preempt or to predict our ultimate findings. What I can say is that any refinements or more material changes to our framework will be aimed solely at enhancing our ability to achieve and sustain our objectives. Stepping back, earlier today, speakers at this conference discussed the challenges of making monetary policy in an uncertain and risky environment. In my remarks, I've laid out an important example of the interaction between the macroeconomy, monetary policy, and the market response to risk. The papers you are about to discuss through the next two days present cutting-edge research on the effects and measurement of risk and uncertainty and volatility with a special focus on monetary policy and market behavior. I look forward to learning from your insights and encourage your rich discussion over the next few days and your, connect, your continued work on these important topics. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you.